Welcome back to another class, lesson two in our 10-week uh, course. Thanks be Welcome to God. Welcome back to another class, lesson two Let's in see. our... Uh, All right, very good. Let's get started then. And uh, we're going to be doing a lot tonight. We're going to be working hard to bring you the most material in the best fashion. So we want to get started right away. But before we do a few announcements, a reminder uh, that as we go through this material, you'll have an opportunity to come back at any time uh, and re, uh, reload and look at the, the, the live stream. Uh, you'll have access in Patreon to the PDF, which we'll upload after the course, after the lesson tonight. And You'll, uh, you'll have an opportunity to uh, go deeper. So don't, don't get too uh, bent out of shape, too, too uh, worried about the, 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 uh, the, the amount of material that you're going to be seeing. You'll be able to come back to it and examine it. That's the first thing. The second thing is all, for all of our newcomers, all of those coming uh, to us through YouTube and Facebook, uh, 
I hope you'll stay with us for the next eight weeks, nine weeks. We're going to be doing all of these lectures online free uh, without any kind of need to access uh, our Patreon Crowdcast platform. So you'll be able to view these videos uh, and, and participate here. And we invite you to come and join us as well on the Patreon platform, which you can have access to for any amount of donation you like, even $1, $3, whatever you like. And you'll have access to all the lectures, not just these, uh, not just the question and answers for these lectures, but you'll have access to all of the lectures that we've done since the summer, since we opened up the platform and all is going forward. So the Orthodox Survival Course, the Truth of Our Faith Course, Father Sarah from Rose, uh, uh, Orthodox Survival Course, uh, his actual text and examination of that, and on the Divine Liturgy. And then in the spring, God willing, after this course, we'll, we'll begin um, our course on the Catacomb Church and the New Martyrs of Russia as a type of the end times. And then sometime around Pentecost and throughout the summer, We'll begin our look at the book of revelation so we've got a lot of material and uh it's all uh, accessible along with the pdfs and the uploads and all the material that we've produced over the last six months and we'll, we'll produce going forward so we we'll invite you all to join us there and it's a good community you have access also to the online forum that's been created the orthodox ethos forum uh, where people exchange you know, ideas and help one another uh, in, in many ways. So we look forward to seeing all of you, all of you who are visiting uh, with us this Thursday, 9 p.m. We'll have our second session on this lesson. We'll have our question and answers. I don't know if we'll get to very many tonight because we have a lot of material to cover. So let's get started right away and jump in. We're going to be looking again at the mainly at the question of the so-called baptismal controversy which took place in the third century and involved uh, St. Cyprian of Carthage, Pope Stephen of Rome, St. Dionysius of Alexandria, St. Uh, Firmilian of uh, Caesarea, the predecessor and the throne to St. Basil uh, the Great. Uh, but we'll start a little bit before that. We'll look at the roots in St. Ignatius and others, and then we'll go a little bit beyond that and look a little bit at St. Basil and uh, we'll have a little change in the program because we're going to be looking at, uh, in the next lesson, next week, we'll be looking at Canon 1 and Canon 47 of St. Basil, which are really crucial in, our, in the formation of our ecclesiology and, and our pastoral theology in terms of the reception of converts. So we'll look forward to seeing you next week for that. Probably won't get to that much tonight. There's just too much material to cover. And that'll push next week's uh, scheduled uh, look at St. Uh, Augustine's uh, on baptism probably to the second half of that class, if not to the next week. So this, this happens inevitably. Uh, we have these kind of changes uh, as we grapple with the material and we see just how much we can get done. All right, so we'll say we'll start with our prayers. Uh, I'll put that on the screen, our prayer, and then we'll chant uh, the Troparion for the Feast of Pentecost, as we always do at the beginning of these lessons, and then we'll jump, jump right into uh, our text. So let's see. Uh, there is the uh, Troparian, and here is the prayer. So let's get going. Mm -hmm. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Illumine our hearts, O Master, who lovest mankind, with the pure light of the divine knowledge. Open the eyes of our minds, with the understanding of the gospel teachings. And plants also fear of thy blessed commandments and trample down all kind of desires. We may enter a spiritual man of living, both thinking and doing such things will please and to thee. But now the illumination of our souls and bodies, O Christ our God. And to thee we ascribe glory, together with thy Father, who is from everlasting and the all holy, good and life giving spirit, now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Evlogito si Christe o Theo Simon o Pansophus tu salis anadixas catapemsas abstis to pneuma to angion ke di afton 
Dinico meni saiginensas filantrope doxasi. <clears throat> All right. So let's take a look at our PDF and our material. We're going to be going into lesson two on the unity of the church and the mystery of baptism. So much has uh, come to pass throughout church history around these two issues, so important to the life of the church. Of course, the boundaries laid down at all the ecumenical councils, precisely that's what was happening there. They were laying down the boundaries of the faith, but also in practice, the boundaries of initiation and the three mysteries that are inseparable, baptism, chrismation, and communion, the initiation mysteries. And we're going to be looking at baptism in particular. But always remember, when we're talking about baptism, we're talking also inseparably about the mysteries of chrismation and communion, which happen in the Orthodox Church and in the ancient church, universally in West and East. Initially in the West, unfortunately, it fell away after uh, not, not too much uh, into the... Uh, half of the uh, first millennium, the unity of those mysteries as initiation mysteries. So we're going to start our look at the patristic witness of the first two centuries, mainly just highlights. Uh, St. Ignatius of Antioch we'll look at briefly again because he's so important, Clement of Alexandria, Origen, Tertullian, and ancient councils as a um, kind of survey of the main views that were the uh, patristic consensus, the norm in those days. Start off with a quote by Yorosov Pelikan, who is, has some tremendous material that he's collected. He's one of the great uh, academic theologians of the last uh, 50 years in terms of church history and patristic teaching, just giving us a lot of material in his books, his five volumes. This is the first, uh, the, the, the uh, emergence of Catholic tradition uh, so he says heresy and schism were closely related both because both of them violated the unity of the church. It is interesting that in all seven epistles of St. Ignatius, the church was explicitly called holy only once, while the unity of the church and the bishop was one of the overriding preoccupations of all the epistles. So much so that it seems inaccurate to conclude but the most important aspect of the church for the apostolic fathers is its unity. So St. Ignatius is going to go back again and again in his epistles to the, to the question of unity because precisely without that unity, without that those boundaries, without that, that uh, communion, there is no salvation. So it's all about salvation, of course. It's, it's a sociology that's then... Uh, plays itself out clearly in the ecclesiology and, and the understanding of the church's life. So um, St. Ignatius is a towering figure who was who set the tone, and it didn't change, according to our uh, historians, but also, as you see, you will see in the text of the Fathers, it was consistent throughout the first four centuries uh, without any divergence in the, in, in, in the perception of the boundaries and the mysteries. So St. Ignatius expresses the early church's general stance towards schismatics and heretics when he writes in his epistle to the Philadelphians, as children of the light and truth, flee from division and wicked doctrines. But where the shepherd is, there do ye as sheep follow. It goes without saying here, the shepherd is an orthodox bishop and not a heretical bishop, right? Because it, unfortunately it needs to be stated today. Uh, people become quite undiscerning in 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 their approach to uh, obedience today. Uh, if you look at church history, you'll see there were many heretical bishops. And so the question obviously is going to arise, well, what do you do when you have a heretical-minded bishop or priest? Well, you don't do obedience. Uh, but that begs a lot of other questions. We're not going to get into it tonight, but it begs a lot of other questions as, well, how do you discern? How do you know? Uh, on what basis can you be disobedient and all the rest? But uh, there's there's no doubt that obedience has to be predicated upon the orthodoxy because orthodoxy is one of the presuppositions for uh, the Eucharist and the and the unity of the church. So these things 
have to be there for us to have a salvific uh, obedience to hierarchy. So here in the in the writings of the saint, although it's not stated, it's assumed, and there are many things assumed in the patristic text, so we can't just, um, you know, we have to ask those questions and define those terms. Uh, we're talking about orthodox-minded bishops in the church. He goes on, if any man follows him that makes a schism in the church, he shall not inherit the kingdom of God. If anyone walks according to strange opinion, he agrees not with the passion of Christ. Of course, the strange opinion is the heretical teaching, and the schism that's being created, obviously, is uh, a departure from the Orthodox faith that also is assumed here. Uh, it may be not in terms of uh, schisms can happen uh, for reasons that are not explicitly dogmatic, but schism itself is a departure from the nature and the dogma of the church. And so every schism, as as Jerome, St. Jerome uh, famously said, will end up leading to heresy because already from the outset you have a heretical or foreign-minded stance, uh, a non-orthodox ethos that's being brought to bear and creating these uh, schisms for whatever reason. Of course, the passions and pride are always behind every heresy and schism. And finally, he says, within this unity, which is pro proved by communion with an Orthodox bishop, there is the Lord. Outside of this unity, God does not dwell. Okay, so there we have St. Ignatius uh, briefly, just a few excerpts. We have the School of Alexandria, Clement and his disciple Origen, and who played a huge role, even though, unfortunately, Clement had some issues, and Origen, of course, was condemned as for his for heretical teachings, but they were towering uh, teachers of the faith in Alexandria, and many fathers uh, came and learned from them. And this is something we need to remember because we look back and uh, into history at people like Origen or Tertullian, and we have to remember that there was a time when they were orthodox, and their teachings were extremely influential. So we have to we have to discerningly see that not everyone who sat at their foot was a heretic, obviously. Many of the great church fathers sat and learned from them, and there was much to learn. But the somebody like St. Gregory Thaumaturgos, uh, who uh, uh, was a disciple of Origen, he also did not adopt uh, the errors of Origen. So uh, we need to keep that in mind uh, when we're looking at this. Uh, Origen here... Uh, got a typo, should be E-N at the end. Uh, so let's look at, well, the time when St. Irenaeus of Lyon was flourishing, the renowned head of the catechetical school of Alexandria, Clement, wrote his work Stromata around 190 AD, in which he also declared heretical baptism to be no proper and genuine water. And there's another several wonderful clips from, uh, 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 excerpts, I should say, from St. Uh, uh, or from Clement, who which is very important in 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 fleshing out the Orthodox understanding of baptism. We'll we'll repeat we'll repeat those uh, in future classes. Uh, Origen, Clement's famous disciple and successor at the head of the catechetical school, echoes his teacher's sentiments and calls all who desire to be saved to come to the house of salvation, the church outside of which no one is saved. Many people say, "Oh." Uh, that's uh, that's Saint Cyprian's famous, and uh, that's a Cyprianite, Cyprian uh, knight uh, uh, rig rigorism. Well, here we see that actually Origen said it, and many of the early church fathers held it. It's just uh, uh, as Florovsky would will say, uh, it just states the obvious that the church is the body of Christ, and through the church, salvation comes to the world, and in the church, one is uh, purified, illumined. You know, um, so it's not that radical of a statement. Many people think it is. It's not. Uh, if anyone should go out of it, he says, he is guilty of his own death. So these are these are not just the views of a few. This is the views that are the consensus of the fathers in the early church, no, no doubt about it. Let's keep going and look at Tertullian, who is called the master for St. Cyprian. He, he read him uh, on a daily basis. He was the teacher in North Africa for many uh, including uh, St. Cyprian. St. Cyprian uh, was basically a child when he reposed, uh, but they they revered him in North Africa. Uh, he wrote a work called De Baptismo, on baptism, 
uh, and it's the only treatise that's ex that's existent from that exists from that period. Uh, the text expressed not the ideas of one man, but that which was the ecclesiastical doctrine of Christian antiquity, according to uh, uh, Jeffrey Grimshaw in his text on Saint Augustine and the Donatus controversy. The common property of the church long before Tertullian. So. As the church fathers, as we know them, and as the church has taught for generations and centuries, the key of being a church father is that you passing on what was passed down to you from the holy apostles. So this is not a radical statement. You know, this, there are, a church father is not a uh, creative, uh, innovative theologian. They are, they are intentionally passing on what they were given. So when we, when we read what, what we hear from St. Cyprian, it's going to be uh, stressed that what he's doing is passing on what he's been taught uh, from generation to generation before him, the councils and the teachers that came before him, and Tertullian is one of those. His treatise, but also his summary of the four gifts of baptism and his polemic against Marcion make it clear that by the end of the second century, if not 50 years earlier, the doctrine of baptism even without the aid of controversy to give it precision, was so fully developed that subsequent ages down to our own have found nothing significant to add to it. And that's uh, Pelican in his Catholic tradition. <clears throat> he also writes, heretics in the church have not the same God, nor one that is the same Christ. And therefore their baptism is not one with ours either, because it is not the same. A baptism which, since they have not it duly, doubtless they have not at all. And we should probably make a note here. We might have a totally different idea of what a heretic is. We don't even use the term many times today. Uh, obviously, this is some. This is before St. Basil gives us his nice, succinct definition and three categories of, of uh, heresy, uh, schism, and parasynagogue. Uh, those those are not readily apparent in any of the writings before St. Basil, although I would say that he's probably just restating tradition as well in many ways, or just summarizing what he's lived. And so heresy here could include, and I think there's a case to be made that it did include even those that we would probably more readily call schism today. Uh, there wasn't that hard, fast distinction. Those who departed from the communion of the church, they, they came under a general title <clears throat> in those first centuries. Um, Tertullian's words will receive conciliar approval. We learn from St. Cyprian that the African church issued rulings on the matter in a council under the presidency of Agrip Agrippinus of Carthage, bishop next but one to St. Cyprian. Uh, so the council was held probably in 213. Irenaeus proposed in 202, Tertullian around 220, and Cyprian was born in 200 to 210. So you get a sense of what we're talking about right at the beginning of the third century. The council was attended by about 70 bishops drawn from the provinces of Africa, Numidia, and would have taken place about 213, as I said, not long uh, after St. Irenaeus' uh, repose. Uh, so this is this is the the whole tone and is set already long before Saint Cyprian comes to the throne. People oftentimes want to attribute Saint Cyprian with some kind of innovative rigorism. It's it's really not possible to have that interpretation if you consider the context and the predecessors and the councils that had that had come uh, in and were in his uh, uh, memory from his childhood and from uh, his fathers and mothers and all those who had lived those events. Uh, so the council ruled that those who are to be baptized who come to the church from among the heretics. Uh, so it's very straightforward, very simple, and St. Cyprian will continue that, uh, sim that, that simplicity, but with a depth uh, and a, uh, a patristic and scriptural uh, 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 development, which is, uh, which is phenomenal. St. Cyprian informs us that from the time of this council until his day, some 40 years later, Quote, so many thousands of heretics in our provinces have been converted to the church and have neither despised nor delayed. Nay, they have both reasonably and gladly embraced the opportunity to attain the grace of the life-giving labor 
and of the saving baptism. So this, this may be the most ancient council uh, to decide on the matter, or it may be preceded by a council at Iconium, mentioned by St. Firmilian, Bishop of Caesarea and Cappadocia, or those in Senada and many others, according to St. Dionysius of Alexandria. In any case, it's noteworthy that all of these councils agreed, that's the witness we have from St. Dionysius and St. Firmilian, uh, and expressed this consensus of the fathers that they reject the authenticity of heretical baptism. All right, let's keep going. We've got a lot to cover, so we're not going to do too much. We can say a lot, but we're not going to. We're going to. We're going to get to the deeper stuff here and the, uh, the controversy around the third century. This is uh, this section will deal with Saint Cyprian quite a bit, and then a little bit with Saint Firmilian and a little bit with Saint Dionysius in uh, as uh, support coming to the basic positions that we see in Saint Cyprian, who again. Is repeating his master's teaching uh, before Tertullian embraced heresy. In the in the in the mid third century, a sharp controversy erupted wh whether the church should view as authentic the baptisms performed by heretics. The principal spokesmen for this debate were Stephen, Pope of Rome, and Saint Cyprian, Bishop of Carthage. Both hearkened back. To ecclesiastical precedent in their respective sees and history in order to support their positions. However, the early patristic consensus was expressed by St. Cyprian. Let's read about St. Cyprian a bit. We said he was born in 200 AD. He becomes a Christian in 246, and he's immediately, within two years, by popular acclamation, uh, thrust into the throne of Carthage, Bishop of Carthage. Uh, he and Tertullian were inheritors of older practice and conviction of the African church, according to our scholars that we have on these on this time period. The St. Cyprian's characteristics and the key to his whole ministry are to be found in the simple and elementary system of organic unity of St. Ignatius of Antioch. That's according to um, the introduction to the Antinacian Fathers. Uh, 19th century introduction. Some of the older scholarship, frankly, is uh, more uh, and many times more akin to the orthodox approach than, than, in my experience, contemporary scholarship. Unity, the organic unity of the body of Christ, lies at the heart of his vision of the church, and participation in the reality of the mystery of the kingdom of God presupposes incorporation through the mysteries into a living organism the head of the me and members of which form an organic whole and an unbreakable unity unknown and unavailable to them that are without. All right. Let's check and see a little bit what another scholar from our day has to say about this time period. And there's so much we could quote, but we're going to just get to the essence of the thing. Metropolitan John Zizoulis, in his book, Being as Communion, has the following comment, and he has quite a bit uh, that we've uploaded in Patreon uh, and cited uh, for, for, for our, uh, uh, our patrons to read. The connection of the one church with the one Eucharist, the one bishop, the one altar, clearly established already in the teaching of Ignatius, continues through Cyprian, well into the fourth century. This is an important quote because it sees the, it, we can see the continuity that this is an, he's an inheritor of what has been all, all, already taught and accepted by the church, uh, and is not he's not innovating at all. One should add to the list that is mentioned here, of course, the one baptism, and it reminds us of Saint Paul's what we saw last week. Saint Paul's famous uh, quote from Ephesians. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Of course, that would be included in the one Eucharist, one bishop, one altar. Uh, all of that's going to be in the same context, which is the Eucharist. And it's not with respect to the non-repetition. The one baptism does not per pertain only or even mainly to the idea that you don't repeat it. Obviously, that goes without saying. In the church, there's no repetition of baptism. But it refers also to the one 
there being one baptism of the one church, right? The one baptism, one church, one Eucharist. Uh, it's not referring to only uh, the number of times one can do, but that it's a part of the unity of the church. So it's unique to the church. Uh, so just as there are indeed many assemblies called the church, which are not uh, churches, but synagogues of Satan, according to the Revelation, uh, the book of Revelation refers to the synagogues of Satan, 2.9. Uh, there are many sacrifices offered, which are not the one sacrifice. Uh, there are many bishops, which are not overseers of Christ's flock. They're called bishops. They're not, in fact, overseers of Christ's flock. They're not orthodox. There are many altars around which is gathered not the Eucharistic community. And so, too, there are many baptisms or pourings or sprinklings which do not baptize one, do not immerse one, initiate one into the one spirit and the one body that is into Christ. So this is um, this all flows from the early church's experience in ecclesiology. Now, St. Cyprian will hearken back to scriptural passages which focus on and stress the organic unity of the body of Christ. Uh, he lays great emphasis on the empirical unity of the church, and this was expressing the conviction of the church from the beginning. It's not something that he, he created. So he talks about the vine and the branches of our Lord. Ye, I am the vine, ye are the branches, right? And he goes further and he gives the following beautiful uh, description of uh, the ecclesiology of the church, the, the theology of the church. The sun has many rays, but the light is one. The branches of, of a tree are many, but the trunk is one, sitting firmly on its root. Many streams flow from one source, but although the overflowing results from the abundance of waters presents a mu multiplicity, nevertheless, unity is preserved at their origin. Separate a light from its origin, its unity will not allow the existence of a divided light. Break a branch from a tree, the branch thus broken will not be able to grow. Cut off a stream from its source, the stream thus cut off will dry up. So, very straightforward, very basic, very simple, and yet very true. The organic unity of all of this speaks to the organic unity of the church. Our saint... St. Cyprian did not, again, did not innovate, but he follows the Holy Fathers. Let's see how that plays out. Let's see what that means. Like the rays from the sun or streams from the mountain spring, the mysteries flow from the mystery of the church. The mysteries flow from the mystery of the incarnation, which is the church is the continuation of the incarnation throughout history. And we have the Apostle Paul's famous and important uh, description. Uh, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. So soma, body, and pliroma, fullness. These two things are, cor are correlative and closely linked together, the one explaining the other. And according to St. John Chrysostom, they complement they are the complement of Christ. The pleroma, the soma, is the complement of Christ. They go and they are inseparable. Uh, the doctrine of the church and the doctrine of the sacraments, likewise, are corollaries, for both describe the divinely instituted means through which grace was communicated. The doctrine of the church, the doctrine of the sacraments, they go inseparably together. You cannot separate the mysteries from the church impossible they are inseparable so these three now christ the church christ is the head the church is the body and the mysteries which spring forth from the body's side look toward the, the, the crucifixion what happened will come out of the side of the lord we'll talk about that are indissolubly linked together moreover the unity of the mysteries necessarily flows from the unity of the head with his body just as where his head, where the head is, there the body is too. So too, whenever there is one mystery, especially the mystery of initiation, there are all the mysteries. 
and the mystery of the church. This is a very simple thing, but yet this is totally uh, neglected and negated by many of the contemporary ecclesiologists. Let me stop and remind you, this course is not a just a simple or a basic catechetical introduction to the church. The, the point of this course, one of the points, the aims of this course is precisely to, to look at church history and look at the events and the, the teachings of the church fathers in particularly with those aspects which are under assault today, those aspects which we have a challenge from the contemporary uh, uh, milieu of heterodox and non-orthodox teachings, so that you, the faithful, can understand and protect yourselves from those delusions and those heresies. So we're going to be focusing on those that really are contemporary as well. We're going to be focusing on those aspects which are going to help you navigate and this is one of the keys, because today there's this idea that you can have a mystery of baptism, a uh, some other, maybe even the Eucharist, depending on which uh, uh, contemporary ecclesiology outside the church you, you're, you're following. Uh, but mainly baptism is what's usually said, that, that, that we have a common baptism, whether it's in the Orthodox Church or the, or the Papal Protestant Confession or the Pro Reformed Protestant Confession, you have... You have common baptism, this idea. Of course, this is, this is impossible to even imagine within the context of the first four centuries, what we're examining right now. You'll never see anything like that in the teachings of the fathers. So either the church has changed its nature in our day, and so that we can talk about a divided church that has common mysteries, which is impossible and inconceivable for the church fathers, or we have, people in our day, have apostatized from the teaching uh, of the church and of the church fathers. Uh, and that's uh, that's what should become apparent uh, by the end of this course, the truth of, of this, uh, which is the truth of this, what, what, what exactly is going on here. Um, all right. Now, the church fathers don't, they're not scientific analysis, academic analysis. They don't come in that way to the church. The church, the theology of the church, its imagery and idiom, they grow out of the experience of the fathers of encountering the Lord in the Holy Scripture, in the mysteries, in prayer and worship. And so it has an existential character. The, the, the theology is a theology of witness. It, it's witnessing to what they experience. And it's very clear in the epistles of St. John, the theologian, uh, that this is the case. Uh, it's the experience of the Holy Spirit in the church and the understanding, the orthodox understanding of the church is grounded therein. Uh, and let's look at this John 19.34, which we we referenced in, in, in the previous slide. The mysteries which spring forth from the body's side. Let's hear what St. John Chrysostom has to say. And you can see here uh, how it's this unity in the mysteries uh, is so uh, is witnessed to in the fathers, but so important. So the, tech, the the scriptural passage from John 1934 is, but one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. So John Chrysostom sums up the patristic interpretation of this passage, saying, with this too, an ineffable mystery was accomplished. For blood and water came out, not simply without a purpose or by chance, did these founts come forth, but because by means of these two together, together, the church consists. What two together? Blood and water. What do they mean? The Eucharist and baptism. These two are inseparable. They come out together from the body of the church, the body of Christ. And the initiated in the mysteries know it, being by water indeed regenerated and nourished by the blood and the flesh. Notice how the experience, he points to the experience. The initiated in the mysteries, those who've lived these, this reality, they know this reality. So this is not, somebody was saying in one of the discussions underneath, I think the last week's, or one of these talks that I've given, uh, that they, you know, that there's a circular reasoning among the Orthodox that if you can't base it on experience, but that's exactly what the fathers are continually doing. They're not trying to prove anything to the heretics or to the non-Orthodox. 
they're witnessing to an experience and calling all to that experience. And the same is true with Christ who walked on the earth. He didn't go around trying to prove people that he is the Messiah. He just witnessed to it with miracles. He fulfilled the prophecies. He taught the truth uh, and all the rest that was expected uh, and, and was, was need, needful for the salvation of the world. And the church goes about doing the same thing. We're not going to try to prove anything rationally, logically to anyone. So this, this is one of the pitfalls of these discussions online is that well, you, how do you prove what an ecumenical, which, which is an ecumenical council? How can you prove that? It was one of the discussions we had. Um, and, you know, to a certain point, you can describe it. You can say, this is, what it, this is what it's been. This is what it is. This is how we know it. But you're not going to prove that these are authoritative to someone who doesn't have an experience and doesn't have the presuppositions uh, and is approaching it rationalistically, uh, not rationally, but rationalistically. So here he's saying the initiated of the mysteries know it, being by water indeed regenerated and nourished by the blood and the flesh. They know by their experience. Hence, the mysteries take their beginning. That when thou approachest to that awful cup, that awful meaning that all full, full of awe, thou mayest so approach as drinking from the very side of the Lord. See how realistic the saints, the fathers are. They, they, they love it. They, they, they love to get to, to, to connect Christ and the church continually. And that's exactly... Uh, the, their experience, that this is the body of Christ, not, the, not, not a figure of the body of Christ, not a not a symbol, but it's, it's the very body uh, of our Lord that we participate in. So this, our saints, as Saint and Saint Cyprian, of course, follows the Holy Fathers. Let's hear what, uh, again, uh, Yaroslav Pelikan has to say about um, about this. Following St. Ignatius, uh, St. Cyprian held the bishop to be the focal point of the visible unity of the church. Yorkov, Yorkov Pelkin has written, for both Ignatius and Cyprian, moreover, the bishop was the key to authentic unity, and schism was identified as party spirit in opposition to him. Therefore, the efforts to superimpose in the second and third centuries a distinction made by Augustine, St. Augustine, Blessed Augustine, and especially by the Reformation between visible and invisible churches have proved quite ineffectual. Well, that's a, anachronistic. They go back into history and they try to say, look, what we've experienced now in the 15th century or uh, in the 5th century uh, is what they were talking about in the 3rd and 4th century. Uh, and he's saying that's not actually true, that's not accurate. On earth, there was only one church, and it was finally inseparable from the sacramental hierarchical institution. Of course, that's true today, and it's true to throughout, the, throughout all 2,000 years of church history, uh, that, it, that it's just like our Lord, right? You could, if you were walking in Jerusalem when he was there, there would be a place in time that you would meet him, because he had became incarnate. And it's the scandal of the particular that you have to be there and here, not not here, not here, but not there. You have to you have to go to church in a particular place, a particular time, and you have to commune of, of the actual body and blood of Christ. Uh, this whole uh, this reality of the incarnation that the church lives is a scandal and a crucifixion for many rationalistic minds and many of those who would like to make. Uh, Christianity into a philosophy or into a mythology or whatever else. So this is the uh, the hard sayings for those uh, of every age, just like in the time of our Lord, when he turned to his disciples and said, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. These are hard sayings, and many walked away, and many will walk away from the church today when they have to say that this bruised and, and battered body that is the Orthodox Church crucified body throughout history, martyrs upon martyrs upon martyrs. That is the body of Christ. And you, under this guise of, you know, this, this wearied historical reality, uh, and yet it's exactly the, the one of extreme humility, the crucified one who is the Lord of glory. And that's the same with the church as well. So Christ is the one who imparts the mysteries. 
uh, Christ is the one who uh, gives and is given in all the mysteries. For some reason, they've <clears throat> some people have wrongly taken uh, Saint Cyprian as uh, being uh, as saying that the, the administrator himself imparts forgiveness and the Holy Spirit. The famous um, uh, mistake of uh, the the Donatist uh, that it's of not a, and it's not of the Church. Of course, he believed it's of the church uh, that, and it's Christ Himself that is given and is give, gives and is given. Saint Cyprian's fundamental thought, however, was that these gifts are found in the church, and the minister is to be understood as the agent of the church. His statements about ministers not being able to give what they do not have are shorthand for this central claim, uh, and Saint Fermilion has the same thinking. This is the orthodox outlook on things. Uh, this helps so much for us to navigate. So if some priest is unworthy because of a moral life that's not according to the gospel uh, or is intellectually uh, or whatever it might be that is really in, in, an impediment to his proper uh, ministering of the, uh, uh, to the people of God, uh, we always have to remember that it's Christ who is given and, is, and, and gives himself in all the mysteries. We are encountering Christ when we go to confession, when we go to uh, the Eucharist, when, when we, uh, in all the mysteries, all the interactions, it's Christ who has chosen to work through human beings, fallible human beings. He's chosen to be present in them and through them, just like he spoke to his apostles and gave his apostles the, the keys of the kingdom and the power to, to forgive and to, and to hold and all the rest. Uh, so let's never confuse ourselves. And this is an important point because it's, some, some can become, uh, can go off the track, uh, the, the narrow path with such thoughts. Um, St. Cyprian doesn't just say that there's a problem with heretical baptism uh, because it's outside the boundaries of the church. That is the foremost problem. Outside the union, obviously, we've said that outside of Christ, there is, there's no mysteries. Outside the church, there are no mysteries. But he also recognized that the waters of heretical baptism are not only unprofitable, but otherwise uh, benign or neutral. No, they are blasphemous and detrimental, in fact. He calls heretical baptism adulterous and unhallowed water. And sees as, say, as the Saint Athanasius, the great after him, false faith as the source of false mysteries. This is what he says, letter 72. Um, if he believes what is false, he could not receive what is true, but rather he has received things adulterous and profane according to what he believed. This matter of profane and adulterous baptism. Jeremiah the prophet plainly rebukes, saying, Why do they who afflict me prevail? My wound is hard. Whence shall I be healed? Why, while it has indeed become unto me as deceitful water, which has no faithfulness. And so he's going back to the prophet as a way to make his point here. The Holy Spirit makes mention by the prophet of deceitful water, which has no faithfulness. What is the deceitful and faithless water? certainly that which falsely assumes the resemblance of baptism and frustrates the grace of faith by a shadow, shadowy pretense. Um, all right, we'll go, go on to this ecclesiological point, very important. Uh, the, the, it is not a small thing, and what I, I what made some impression on me when you when I was studying this uh, and examining this years ago and looking at it again the last week or so <clears throat> is the how much little um, attention is paid to the conciliar witness before Cyprian and 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 among the uh, the this faithful in Africa and in in Asia in, in Asia Minor. Uh, St. Cyprian calls together, following their 
uh, lead. And this is so important because the concilia, the synodical nature of the church is so important and it's under attack in our day. It's under attack in our day, unfortunately. Uh, there is a, a creeping and rising papalism within the church, uh, a worldliness. Uh, papalism is a, is a, is a, is a uh, offshoot of secularism. Uh, this idea uh, of investing one, one bishop above all the other bishops or one bishop in a local church above all other bishops have taken on a uh, not just a position of honor but of power over uh, above the other bishops that is a sign of a worldliness that has crept in it's not the gospel of our lord jesus christ uh who rebuked the uh desire for thrones in his disciples uh but um uh, rather the synodical and conciliar witness is so important uh, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us it said in the first council in Jerusalem and here again he calls not one not two but three councils to deal with this question and again and again all of the fathers assembled in North Africa come to a, an agreement on what should be done in terms of <clears throat> dealing with the heretical groups and whether there could be uh, a uh, departure from the rule of baptism. So he has a council in 255, 21 bishops, 256, 71 bishops. And then in response to Pope Stephen's intransience and, and stridency, he has a third one in September of the same year, 87 bishops in North Africa. The last council, uh, the bishops were unanimous in expressing the consensus patrum of the time, declaring the church as the sole dispenser of the holy mysteries. The church is the sole dispenser of the holy mysteries. It was in response to the fanatical, the fanatical stance of Pope Stephen that the last and largest of the three councils was called. And Pope Stephen is quoted in letters by St. Cyprian as saying, and this is what they're, they're responding to the theology, the letters of St. Cyprian are responding from this time period, uh, to these ideas. If anyone therefore come to you from any heresy whatsoever, very key point here, from any heresy, there's no dis distinction if, uh, among the heretics uh, at all. Uh, so what, from whatever heresy they come, let nothing be innovated or done which has not been handed down. And of course the claim of, of Pope Stephen was that he's just doing what's been handed down to him in Rome. Uh, and the question is, well, if it's not what's been handed down from the apostles, as St. Familiar says in his letter, well then what good is it? Uh, we're not interested in just custom. We're interested in holy tradition, which is given by the holy apostles. But that's the claim, that we're just doing what we've always done in Rome. And he says that hands be imposed on him for repentance. Since the heretics themselves in their own proper character do not baptize, such as come to them from another, but only admit them to communion. So apparently from this passage, <clears throat> And we have to trust St. Cyprian that he's obviously he's not fabricating the words. He has no reason to do that. There's nobody, I don't think anyone can write, uh, reasonably say he's. this is not the words of Pope Stephen. Uh, the, apparently he's saying, look, they don't do it, so we should not. And of course, St. Cyprian and St. Familian and St. Dionysius respond, it doesn't matter what they're doing. It's none of our, we're not interested in what they're doing. We're the church. The church doesn't have to uh go along with what they're doing, try to win them over in this way or anything like that. This is very instructive for us in our day and age when we see this happening all the time. Uh, hierarchs and, and, and church synods trying to, uh, you know, appease and, and um, mollify the heterodox uh, in, a, in a diplomatic political way. That's not, not what <clears throat> the saints of old did with uh, those outside and those professing another uh, foreign uh, teaching. Pope Stephen, in holding a fierce stance against the consensus of the fathers, St. Dionysius and St. Vermilion and others in Asia Minor, was basing himself on, number one, the customs held in Rome. This is what we've always done, he said. On the authority he claimed he had as the Bishop of Rome, uh, not something uh, that unfortunately lacked in Rome, uh, attributed the efficacy of baptism to the name of Christ, the name of Christ, no matter where nor in what manner the baptism occurred, the name of Christ was, was called upon, and it uh, means also the Holy Trinity, 
uh, then he considered it to be uh, eff have efficacy. And finally, makes no distinction at all between heretics and schismatics, such that St. Cyprian concluded that any heresy whatsoever included Marcion, Valendius, and Apelles, some of the worst, uh, most egregious in, of the heretics in terms of their teaching. Uh, so the heretic was baptized by the power of the name, and yet nevertheless did not possess the Holy Spirit. This was a consensus of all, including Pope Stephen, including uh, later on you'll, we'll, we'll look at the famous, uh, the well-known text from North Africa, which was uh, uh, in opposition to St. Cyprian's teaching, which was supporting Pope Stephen's, uh, which came later, which was uh, on rebaptism. And that author, as well as Pope Stephen, all of them, everyone accepted the teaching that there is no Holy Spirit outside the church. Very important. Third century, Metropolitan John Zulus commemorates this. The consensus of all, no matter what side of the debate, there is no Holy Spirit given. There's no imparting of the mysteries of the Holy Spirit in the mysteries. Uh, that whatever's happening outside, according to the author of the book, uh, which, which is expressing most likely the, the thought of, of Pope Stephen as well, he says that, well, it's a water baptism, just water. There's no Holy Spirit there in the, in the mysteries of the heterodox. Um, and so they don't possess the Holy Spirit, and so they could only be imparted the Holy Spirit through the imposition of Episcopal hands. So the question then becomes, without the Holy Spirit, what mystery are we talking about? What is happening that we can call it a baptism? What kind of baptism is that? Uh, if those outside the church, in order to supposedly <clears throat> to be supposedly baptized, he says, to be baptized, you have to have the Holy Spirit. Why are hands laid on them for receiving the Spirit when they convert to the church? So it's you, know, you can't. He's saying you talk about a baptism, but there's no Holy Spirit. Is this is this possible? And if you're if it's really a Holy Spirit, if you're really a baptism, then obviously the Holy Spirit is there because that's that's what is happening in the mystery of baptism. So then, why lay hands on them? So there's no Holy Spirit, then what is this baptism? If the heretic or schismatic is lacking in the Holy Spirit, he's not. is he not necessarily lacking in the other, which is the forgiveness of sins that come through baptism, which includes uh, the uh, action of the Holy Spirit. So he says the gifts belong together. They cannot be separated. The Holy Spirit is not given by measure, he says. It's poured out all together on the believer, indeed. And so you have the very beginnings, what will then become over time in the West, this idea of somehow having one in incomplete communion eventually. It looks like this is the beginning of that idea, which will then flower and take off at the Second Vatican Council. You have people who are somewhat Christians, which is impossible, of course, in the Orthodox and patristic view of things. Moreover, the water and the spirit belong together in baptism, he says. And since we are a spiritual reborn in baptism, it is absurd to claim that he who has put on Christ is unable to receive the Holy Spirit whom Christ sent. So St. Cyprian argues strenuously for the unity of the mysteries. Strenuously. And he wants to keep all of the acts together in one unified ceremony. And this is exactly what we are struggling to do today as Orthodox, to maintain that unity. It's essential. We talked about it. Christ, the church, and the mysteries, all one. The two from the side of our Lord, uh, all of it together, the unity. If, that, is that, if that's lost, then the unity of the church is lost. So remember now, St. Cyprian is dealing with a pope, Pope Stephen, who is very strident and autocratic. He calls him a false Christian. He calls him a false apostle. He calls him a deceitful worker. Uh, he threatens the people in Asia Minor with excommunication if they persist in the support of the, of the practice of baptizing heretics. Uh, and instead of any kind of uh, response in like, St. Cyprian simply calls a council. And that's how he deals with this. St. Cyprian continues. 
He who is sent will be greater than he than him who sends. He's talking about the thinking of Pope Stephen and the and those who support this idea. So that one baptized without may begin indeed to put on Christ, but not be able to receive the Holy Spirit, as if Christ could either be put on without the Holy Spirit or the Holy Spirit be separated from Christ. Moreover, it is silly to say that although the second birth is spiritual by which we are born in Christ through the labor of regeneration, one may be born spiritually among the heretics where they say that the Spirit is not. For water alone is able, not able to cleanse away sins, to sanctify man, unless he have also the Holy Spirit. Wherefore, it is necessary that they should grant the Holy Spirit to be there where they say that baptism is, or else there is no baptism where the Holy Spirit is not, because there cannot be baptism without the Holy Spirit. This is a hugely important point. He is prophetic in his analysis. This is exactly what will happen in the West and what will come to be at the Second Vatican Council. In these later generations, starting mainly after the schism, this is when things take off, but take it, fulfillment in the Second Vatican Council, they will change this idea and they will give and, and, and grant the Holy Spirit and the and the, the the baptism be an efficacious baptism with the grace of the Holy Spirit to all the heterodox, all those who are not in the communion of the uh, Roman uh, Church, the the Latin Papal Protestant Confession. Uh, they will say this, uh, even if you're not a part of the uh, church here that we, the communion that we have, you're among the Protestants and you have. Maybe you don't even recognize there is a Eucharist. You have no Eucharist, but you you baptize. Well, they will. They now recognize that as uh, a beginning, uh, a part. Uh, as Saint uh, Cyprian says here, um, that they uh, begin to indeed put on Christ, uh, and so there is. That and, they, and they grant that the Holy Spirit is working and that that, that the person is initiated uh, somehow, partially, incompletely, into the mystery of the church. So this is, this is what will happen, and this is, he prophesied it, he said it here, that this is what will happen, exactly what, what has come to pass. Uh, uh, Yaroslav Pelican says here that, that whatever the precise moment of the coming of the Holy Spirit may have been thought to be, what St. Cyprian here is saying is a Catholic doctrine. In other words, they cannot be separated. Uh, the mysteries and the, and the Spirit of God cannot be separated. All right, going on, because there's a lot to cover. Uh, birth or baptism and the Spirit in Christ alone. Uh, St. Cyprian's response to this idea of a spiritless baptism is profound yet simple and proven to be in agreement with the heart of the tradition the, the ascetic Hesychast tradition of the Nitic Fathers. Listen to what he says, and then we're going to go and we're going to uh, see this even more deeply with St. Seraphim of Sarah. No one is born, he says, by receiving the Holy Spirit through the imposition of hands, but through baptism. As in the case of the first man, Adam, only by being already born does he receive the Spirit. It was after God had molded him that he breathed into him, through his face, the breath that gave him life. Someone must uh, already be in living existence to be able to receive the Spirit. Otherwise, he cannot receive it. Birth, in the case of Christians, is at their baptism. So that the giving birth in baptism and sanctification exists with the bride of Christ alone. Very interesting that the teaching here is in total agreement with St. Seraphim of Seraph and the patristic niptic tradition. St. Seraphim laments in his day that, um, let me give a little background to that for a second. So St. Cyprian expresses this uh, in a simple way, the original Christian knowledge, without which the true meaning of such key passages of scripture is obscured, if not lost, and with it the purpose of the Christian life itself. Far from being overly logical or narrow and dry, uh, superficial reading, which some might conclude, 
the clarity and the simplicity of his words show their genuineness. All things are simple to those who find knowledge, as it said in uh, um, uh, Proverbs. So this is all made apparent when one considers the divine words spoken nearly 1,600 years later by the great Russian ascetic and Hesychus father, St. Seraphim of Seraph, to Motovilov, who agrees fully with St. Cyprian's exegesis of Genesis. The saint laments that in his day, Christians had nearly abandoned the true Christian life under the pretext of education and had reached such a darkness of ignorance, he says, such a darkness of ignorance that the ancients understood so clearly seems to us almost inconceivable. Because men do not seek the grace of God, they misunderstand the words of Scripture and remain without enlightenment. So in particular, he laments how people interpreted the passage from Genesis, and God fashioned man from the dust of the earth and breathed into his face the breath of life, and man became a living soul as meaning that there was neither human soul nor spirit in Adam, but only flesh. He says, this interpretation is wrong. Adam was not created dead, but an active living being. If the Lord God had not breathed afterwards into his face the, this breath of life, this, that is, the grace of our Lord and God, the Holy Spirit, proceeds from the Father and rests in the Son and is sent into the world for the Son's sake, Adam would have remained without having within him the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit who raises him to a godlike dignity. But when the Lord God breathed into Adam's face the breath of life, then according to Moses' word, Adam became a living soul that is completely and in every way like unto God, according to the image and likeness, and like him forever immortal. So, Although the Holy Spirit was certainly present and working at Adam's birth, he was not given internally to Adam until the breath of the Lord. So Adam was created and existed, but only truly became alive and godlike with the breath of the Spirit. Likewise, baptism as a new birth is necessarily first, for it reconciles man to God. Yet without chrismation, the quickening of man's spiritual energies and his continual ascent to the likeness of God uh, they are halted. So, baptism is a new birth. It's necessarily first, and it reconciles to God. Uh, the birth and becoming a living soul, that is, baptism and the energy and seal of the Holy Spirit, are inseparable expressions of the one creation, the recreation of man within the paradise of the church. Neither separation of birth and life nor a delay of them is possible. You can't separate these, these things. You can't separate baptism and chrismation. You can't separate the creation of Adam and the breathing in to talk about completion, fulfillment, life in Christ. You can't do that. It's impossible to conceive of multiple expressions such that we have heretical and schismatic bodies uh, doing this, giving this expression of the one in breathing from the one Lord by the one Spirit. So neither a foreign source nor a fallen source is possible for this new birth and this new life. It's the it's Christ himself in his church and nowhere outside of that. So as once spiritual life flowed from the mouth of the Lord unto Adam, it now flows from the side of the Lord to recreate Adam. Let me say that again. It flowed from his mouth into Adam, and now it flows from the side of the Lord to recreate Adam. What's, what's the sign of the Lord? The baptism, chrismation, Eucharist, all the unity of the mysteries, all together. It's coming from the side of the Lord, which is the church. And so we see here, St. Cyprian truly is a representative of the general patristic consensus <clears throat> up until our day. Now we have the anonymous uh, tract uh, from uh, North Africa, which is basically uh, believed to be an expression of Pope Stephen. We don't have a lot of Pope Stephen's writings. We have a few reproduced in St. Cyprian's letters. But uh, it's believed that this tract was essentially representing the views that were held by Pope 
Stephen and those in Rome. So let's hear what he has to say. It's important. Helps us to get a, a better sense of uh, where we are uh, with respect to not just the debate then, but also what people s s uh, say today in our day and age. He says, if, however, baptism should have been administered by strangers, let this matter be amended as it can and as it allows. So strangers would be those, obviously, among the schismatic or heretical groups. Because outside the church, there is no Holy Spirit. You see how he has the same consensus, that no one doubts that. But today, everyone, there are many people who doubt that. Many people believe that the Holy Spirit is throughout all the different heterodox groups in the Orthodox Church. They make no distinction of the energies and the actions and the presence of the Spirit. There's no distinctions made. It's in the church, outside the church, doing the same thing. It's not, though. Church in the church is purifying, illuminating, deifying, and those have presuppositions, those energies of God. Outside the church is guiding and enlightening in a different way those to come to the knowledge of the truth. It's, 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 uh, it's showing the path to those who have good disposition. It's the sustaining spirit, uh, the, the divine energies that sustain the world, uh, the providential energies, etc. But it, it, it cannot, we cannot lose all the distinctions here. And so he says here, look, outside the church there's no Holy Spirit. What he means is not that the Holy Spirit does not support all of creation and keep everyone alive. Obviously, all everything is in the Holy Spirit in that sense. He means there's no mysteriological, there's no mysteries, there's no Holy Spirit that purifies, illumines, and deifies outside the church. That's what he means, all right? Uh, sound faith, moreover, cannot exist. Look at that, what he says. So orthodoxy cannot exist. The Holy Spirit, the mysteries, the divine energies of purifying, illuminating, deifying cannot exist outside the church. Obviously, you cannot speak of the Eucharist outside the church. That would be impossible. So the presuppositions of the church do not, cannot, they cannot be reproduced outside the church. And yet we have theologians, brand name theologians, who tell us that heterodox and orthodox Eucharists are the same, that, that we have we share the Eucharist. Well, if we shared the Eucharist with the heterodox or any any non-Orthodox group, we would be the church. There would be the one church, and we would have a divided church, we had, uh, which is an heretical teaching. So we have, a, unfortunately, a increasing chasm from traditional Orthodox ecclesiology found even among the those who spoke against the teaching of Cyprian and the tradition. Even they recognized what seem, today many people do not, unfortunately. Uh, he says, uh, no sound faith, no Holy Spirit, not uh, alone among heretics, but even among those who are established in schism. So he says even the schismatics don't have sound faith and the grace of the divine mysteries, the Holy Spirit. And for that reason, they who repent and are amended by the doctrine of the truth and by their own faith, which subsequently has been improved by the purification of their heart, ought to be aided only by spiritual baptism. That's an interesting phrase, spiritual baptism. What he means is that laying out of hands. Uh, and by the administration of the Holy Spirit. Uh, so there's just a water baptism, he's saying, outside among them. And now he's gonna, they're going to receive the Spirit. So he's dividing the mysteries. He's saying that, the, that there is such thing as a water baptism in Orthodoxy. We've never heard of that. What is that? We don't believe in a water baptism. That was happening before. That's when, when Paul went. We're going to talk about that. When Paul went and he, he, asked the, he asked some of the disciples of John, Did, were you baptized with the... Holy Spirit, and they said no, and then the Holy Spirit descended. That was the same event, one, one and the same. It wasn't divided. It wasn't one time the Holy Spirit did together. Uh, and, and even with Cornelius and others who the Holy Spirit descended, he immediately baptized them. So these things are united. They're united. You see how the order of things can even be changed? We're going to talk about that as well. St. Vermillion talks about that. Uh, so they're going to get they receive a, a spiritual baptism, whatever that is for him. Uh, by the imposition of the bishop's hands, by the administration of the Holy Spirit. Moreover, the perfect seal of faith has been rightly accustomed to be given in this manner and on the principle in the church. So he again maintains that only in the church can you have the right faith. Only in the church can you have the mysteries. All right, so let's respond to this because this is important. This, this, these are arguments you're going to hear in our day and age as well. So he allows for the autonomy of baptism. And this is very important. Their mysteries cannot be autonomous. We don't have autonomous mysteries. He allows for that, or at least some kind of baptism. He allows for there to be outside, among strangers. Uh, I want you to compare that with the words of St. Gregory the Theologian in his oration 
on holy baptism, which he explicitly says that baptism not be given by one who is a stranger, a lotrios, stranger, to the church. So St. Gregory the Theologian does not agree with the author on rebaptism, that such a thing is possible. Uh, St. Cyprian, if he had the opportunity to respond, which he apparently did not, he would, I think, would have said, can strangers to the church and the Lord initiate other strangers into the bridal chamber? When does that happen? How does that happen? We don't know that. Only the children of the bridal chamber can, can uh, have been given the privilege of serving the bridegroom in this capacity. All right. So <clears throat> this is just foreign to the whole experience of the initiation and of the, of the uh, uh, you know, the church has its doors. They close and you have to be initiated. So strangers can't do that. Strangers cannot do that. Although it has, it has taken a step away from the consensus pageant. This is now this is something interesting that we have to recognize because not even this is kept any longer in many places. So he goes into the strange reality of, of recognizing strangers as baptizing. And, and you, you'll read later on in Trent that they will recognize uh, unbelievers and Jews uh, and Muslims and anybody who does the form, keeps the keeps what and has the intention of uh, of the uh, Latin church uh, and and says the words they're going to recognize those as real mysteries that's where that's how far they're going to go away from the vision we have here in the saints of uh, the unity of the mysteries uh, but this is a for, this is a first test a first taste of that uh, that will come uh, hundreds of years later so uh, number two though he, he he maintains certain aspects of the patristic vision which are very important so he goes away from the consensus patrim on the question of baptism per se. Uh, he still strives to maintain the oneness of the church and exclusivity of the Holy Spirit's working mysteriologically within her. So he, he tries to keep that unity. He knows he has to. There's, there's not even a thought that you could somehow theor have a different theory about this. Uh, it's a conviction that was unanimously held Following the Holy Fathers, he maintains the integrity of the body and of the faith and the prerequisite of unity with the head in order to possess the right faith. He does not accept the idea that the right faith can exist apart from the communion of the church or that other criteria besides visible unity with the church alone suffice for Orthodox. you got to be in the church. you got to have the faith. you got to be in the church, though, too. So having a ideological assent, assent of accepting theoretically the faith does not make you a member of the church. You need both. To be initiated. Uh, thus, it's not surprising that, as was common at this time, he makes no distinction between the baptism of heretics and schismatics. Notice he says schismatics and heretics are the same. Because the, the question was not what they believed in their head. The question is, where are they? Are they in communion? Are they in the body? And this is something very important later on when we start to interpret the canons later on. You see this all the time with, with serious people in the church. They say, well, the church accepts the Arians this way or the Eunomians that way or the papal Protestants that way because of something that these groups believe. But that's actually not the mind of the church. That's not what the Kodi Fathers, Fathers will say later on following the early church fathers. It's not a question of what they believe. That's a question of a proximity in terms of how many hurdles they have to get come back to the faith, how far they have fallen theoretically, theologically in their expression, and that's a sign of their spiritual state. But the minute you depart from existentially from the communion of the church, you're out. You're outside. Anybody who doesn't commune for three weeks is considered out of communion. He needs to come back. And, and So that's the experience of the church. It's very real. It's very existential. Very, uh, it's not uh, ideological, theoretical, philosophical. We don't have these kind of criteria. It's a practical, down-to-earth, real experience that you have to maintain if you're going to be in communion with God. Then we go on on the rebaptism track number two, response number two. Uh, on the other hand, in agreement with Pope Stephen, he bases his his severance of baptism from the church on the power of the name of Jesus, which has great power to not to be disdained and which ought to be received as a certain beginning of the mystery of the Lord. And here, here, brothers and sisters, his whole thing falls apart. I mean, he really departs, and we'll see uh, St. Cyprian's response, uh, which is uh, very clear. This is, an this is totally incompatible with the conviction that the right faith can exist only within the communion of the church. 
since merely the invocation of the name without the right faith and therefore outside the community of the church does not suffice for the vein of grace. He contradicts himself. He contradicts himself because on the one hand he says faith is only impossible in the church. Now he says that the calling on the name alone it becomes magical. You have to have the right faith. St. Cyprian says in response, there is no ground for anyone for the circumvention of Christian truth opposing to us the name of Christ and saying, all who are baptized everywhere and in any manner in the name of Jesus Christ have obtained the grace of baptism. You know, you know why they've rejected St. Cyprian in medieval Catholicism? Because they adopted the view of the, uh, more or less the view of the anonymous author of this tract. And they, they've rejected St. Cyprian's uh, presentation, unfortunately. And then they end up uh, with absurd things like saying a Muslim or a Jew or a atheist or anybody, as long as they're doing the externals and they're, they're intending to do what the church does, they can baptize. So this is where things end up. And, and this is the nature of, her of heretical delusional teaching. It, it begins smaller, sometimes very small, and then it grows over time if it's not dealt with. Uh, but he says, um, when Christ himself speaks, he says, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again, he forewarns and instructs us that no one should be easily deceived by false prophets and false Christ in his name. Many, he says, shall come in my name, saying, I am the Christ. Uh, and shall deceive many. And afterwards he added, but take ye heed, behold, I have foretold you all things. Whence it appears that all things are not at once to be received and assumed which are boasted of in the name of Christ, but only those things which are done in the truth of Christ. All right, so our Lord himself has, gives us two examples of where the name alone will not benefit you. It's not possible. Call a name, Lord, Lord, but I don't know you, he says. Or the name they will come in my name and they are false prophets. So on what basis can we say the name alone when our Lord himself rejects it? Uh, can become, uh, have the power of initiating people into the church without the truth and the faith and the existential continuation of the incarnation, the actual communion in the church. Now, St. Saint, uh, Saint Cyprian is not just following the Holy Fathers. The Holy Fathers are following him. Listen to what St. Athanasius the Great will say about 100 or so years, 140 years later, uh, more or less, I'm not sure exact dates. I think that's about right. But 100 years later, uh, he uh, he's talking about the Arians, the Manichaeans, the Phrygians, the disciples of Paul of Samosata. What does he say? For not he who simply says, Lord, O Lord, gives baptism, but he who with the name also has the right faith. Sound familiar? On this account, therefore, our Savior also did not simply command to baptize, but says first, teach, then thus, baptize, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. First teach, first the faith, first catechism, first initiation, first humility, first submission to the church, then baptize, that the right faith might follow upon learning, and together with the right faith, might come the consecration of baptism. We're going to come back to this in the next, next, next lesson. We're going to talk about the whole quote. I'll give you the whole quote and how important this is. St. Athanasius the Great in his treaties uh, against the Arians, hugely important a witness to the common tradition and totally in sync with St. Cyprian of Carthage. So... Uh, Pope Stephen, whose views is most he's, is, is is most likely represented by this 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 tract, shows himself uh, to be outside the consensus patrum when making baptism into simple simple water rite. This if this this uh, tract is making baptism into a simple water rite, autonomous from the church, her faith, her mysteries. And even if they still hold, following the Holy Fathers, that outside the church, the Holy Spirit cannot be imparted mystologically. Even if they keep that, they're still departed from the tradition. <clears throat> All right. So
Let's look at St. Cyprian and the economy of God. I think this is important because later on we're going to talk about the economy, economia, uh, and the crivia, exactactitude and economy in Saint uh, next week in St. Basil the Great. <clears throat> so it's very important to understand that St. Cyprian talks about it as well. Many people don't understand this. He doesn't talk about it in the exact same ways as St. Basil will, but it's there. And he's very discerning, his understanding that God is not ultimately subject or bound uh, to his own laws. But nevertheless, he does not transgress them when surpassing or suspending them in order to fulfill them by another route. Uh, and this is at the heart of the church's pastoral economy. I'm getting ahead of myself a bit. Let's look at this page, at this uh, card here. Uh, Early on in the debate, before we get to the other more developed view, somebody asked St. Cyprian, what then shall become of those who in past times, coming from heresy to the church, were received without baptism? Very good question, right? People have that question today. What's going to happen to people? And it's an interesting reply. It's an interesting reply. I think it's important. His reply revealed <clears throat> uh, the deep trust he had in the providential care of the Lord for his church and for every soul. The Lord is able by his mercy to give indulgence and not to separate from the gifts of his church those who by simplicity were admitted into the church and in the church have fallen asleep. So he's talking about people who have already departed this life. And we have every reason to believe that if they had not departed this life, along with St. Familian, who says it very clearly in response to St. Dionysius in, in one of his letters, he rebukes St. Dionysius who does not want to correct the error. And St. Cyprian, I have believe, although I don't have a reference, was of the same mind. Because he says, here, those who've fallen asleep. But he says, look, God's going to take care of it. So he's, 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 he's nodding to the fact that, of course, the, the same Lord who saved the thief on the cross without a water initiation, water baptism, he had baptism of blood, but he didn't have the baptism that the Lord said all should have. Uh, this economy of God, that God is above all his works and above all his laws, that he can take care of it. I think this is the implication here. Uh, he says more elsewhere, which, which we don't have time to quote. But so there's a sense of the economy of God, absolutely, in St. Cyprian. And there's more, there's more references that are even more specific. Let's talk now let's, the, the question of economy and freedom of God here. Uh, we talked. We said that there's this at the heart of the church's pastoral economy. There's this idea that God, uh, who's ultimately not bound by His own laws, uh, does not transgress them when surpassing or suspending them in order to fulfill them by another route. That's economy, right? Economy is a temporal, a temporary suspension of the norm or the acrivia or the exactitude. Because of the circumstances demanded, there's some extenuating circumstances, an exception. And so it's a temporary part, uh, departure from, the, from, the, from the, 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 the exactitude of the canon or the exactitude of the, of the commandment. And it goes by another route, but it returns to the exactitude. This is very important. Economia is salvific. Economia is salvific. Now, listen to this. The bishop, while bound to observe and preserve the sacred ordinances of the faith, without alert, altering or abolish him in the least, is nonetheless empowered by Christ to manage them, or if need be, to transcend them in order to ultimately fulfill them by other means. So <clears throat> this is exactly what Christ did in his economy, didn't he? Exactness of the first path of salvation of Adam and Eve, having been forfeited by the first formed, he came and dwelt among us not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. By revealing grace and truth and giving men the power to become sons of God through faith. That's the economy of Christ in his economy of salvation. That's exactly what he did. That's exactly what happens in the church as well. We have the acrivia, we have the exactitude, we have a departure. So we need to talk about this because we're going we're gonna to see it very quickly in St. Basil's teaching. I'm going to just mention it here. We're going to come back to it next week. So economia is the is a term in Greek for household management, ecos and nomos. Nomos is law, ecos is house, the law of the house. All right? The law of the church, the law of the, 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 the management of the church probably would be the best way to put it. So the principle, this principle has never been doubted, never been 
it's always been accepted universally by all the church fathers. Uh, and of course, the presuppositions of when it can be enacted, the discernment one needs and how it's done is, of course, up to debate. But the principle is not. And so we could never take that away from, uh, from the, the pastor. The pastor always has this. And if we did, we would become very legalistic and it would be uh, the, the end of pastoral work among the faithful. But there are obviously guidelines for this. It's not a free-for-all. You can't just do whatever you like and call it economia. St. Basil the Great makes two references in his canons having to do with reception. Why am I pointing this out? Obviously, there are the references in many places in the Church Fathers, but particularly having to do with how do we receive heterodox into the Church, how do we receive the heretics. Why do I say that? Because people, some people, are claiming that you uh, that this, this economia does not apply to the reception of converts. In fact, somebody so great as Florovsky made this error, and there's been a few who have pointed this out. This is an error. That it cannot be applied to the mysteries. It cannot be applied, but it's right here in the canons of St. Basil. They, they like to interpret that away and say, no, 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 that's not really what he's talking about. He says it right here. He says, In so much, however, as it has seemed best to some of those in the regions of Asia, for the sake of economy, this translation has extraordinary concession. I don't think that's a very good translation, but anyway. Dekthine afton to baptisma esto dekton. To the many, to accept their baptism, let it be accepted. Now, this is not an overturning of the Ecrivia of St. Cyprian. He commemorates St. Cyprian, and he, he commemorates him and St. Familian approvingly. We're going to talk about that next week. I'm getting ahead of myself. But it is exactly the application of the exception that keeps the rule. He goes on in Canon 47, which is very clear. And I'll just read the Greek, the English, because we don't have time. Precisely as in the case of the present day Romans, for the sake of economy. So he's interpreting the Roman practice of his day of accepting by a, another means besides baptism as economy. I'm not sure the Romans understood it that way. I, I, I would hope that, that would be, there would be a consensus there. But it does, I'm not sure that's the case. Doesn't seem to be the case, at least in, in Pope Stephen. Uh, and so in that context, he's certainly saying, look, they, there's economy there. But he says, look, it doesn't matter to us. We will baptize. And we'll come back to that. It's very important uh, to understand the context because people get very confused about this today. All right, we're almost, we're almost done. We're going to blow through some of these because we've, we've gone way over an hour and a half already. Um. I'm going to actually skip this one because this is more of the same about the economy. We'll go to the next one. Christ-centered equals church-centered. All right? So let's let's just note the, the love of and the center of everything, which is the church. For those who are not churched, for those who don't understand why the church is, uh, Christ is all in all in the church. Uh, St. Cyprian speaks of the Lord's mercy in, 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 in such instances, right, when, when we were citing above. Um He's talking about the economy of God in, in, in the church. Uh, even then, he always has the center and the criterion of his thought is the church. It's the gifts of the church for those admitted to the church and those who fall asleep in the church. Okay, So the, the exceptions do not at all overturn the acrivia of, uh, of the boundaries and of, of, of the necessity for all the mysteries. Uh, from his mouth could flow just as effort, effortlessly and genuinely, the sentiments of St. John Chrysostom would utter some 140 years later. It's the same spirit, same mind of the two great fathers. Take refuge in the church, he says. Abide in the church. Be clothed with her raiment. Rest on her foundation. There are many stars, but only one sun. There are many ways of living, but only one paradise. There are many temples, but only one mother of them all. There is the body, the eye, the finger, but all of these make up but one man. You see, again and again, you find this all over St. John Chrysostom's writings. It talks about the oneness, the unity, the, the, the organic uh, nature of the unity in the church and how everything has to happen in the church, for the church, in Christ, for Christ. These are synonymous. Now we're going to move on quickly to St. Fermilion, who's a very important figure, unknown, not paid attention to too much, but he was hugely important 
for some of the councils that happened in Asia Minor. And he was a predecessor, as I said, on the throne of Caesarea to St. Basil. And he was a major support of St. Uh, uh, Cyprian. And his, his uh, for I had given him for reading for the ninth course, his uh, Epistle 74, because it's very formative and important. We'll just talk a little bit about what he, some points he made here in response to Pope Stephen. St. Vermilion, Archbishop of Caesarea and predecessor of St. Basil, joined St. Cyprian in resisting both the errors of St. Pope Stephen and his ecclesiastical bullying. He rejects the claim of Pope Stephen was following the tradition of the apostles because the heresies challenging the church at the time arose later than the apostles. Moreover, the church in Asia Minor had always kept the true practice of rejecting heretical baptism as unlawful and unholy immersion. Note they were immersed, they were they, there was immersion then. <laughs> Today, most heterodox do not immer, do not do immersion at all. Saint Fermilian's position will later be referenced by Saint Basil in his letter to Saint Amphilochius as precedent, giving his claim to the following a practice from time immemorial greater weight. So Saint Basil comes along and, and, and references him and, and in an approving way. Anybody who interprets it otherwise. Is, is does not understand how a saint works. A saint would never reference another saint only to reject him. If they were going to reject the teaching of a holy father, a predecessor, they would be silent about it. They would not have commemorated him. Uh, I think there's a, a Professor Erickson or some some other who's written on this have have suggested that that he does not follow Saint Cyprian, even though he commemorates him. That's just not possible. The saints don't do that. There's going to be uh, any rejection of their teachings, they're not going to commemorate the teachings. Uh, in refutation of the idea of a spiritless baptism, in other words, a baptism of a simple water rite, as we saw in the on baptism text, uh, St. Familian wonders how they could hesitate to baptize anew those baptized without the Holy Spirit when the blessed Apostle Paul did as much with the baptism of the forerunner John. He wonders, Paul was inferior to the bishops of these times? So that these indeed can be uh, can by imposition of hands alone give the Holy Spirit to those heretics who come to the church, while Paul was unfit to give the Holy Spirit but needed to first baptize? So the question could at that time still be posed, for all shared the common ground of refusing the mysterological action of the Holy Spirit to heretics and schismatics. Very important point, which is lost today. It's been lost. They're not even on that page anymore, the heterodox. As we shall see with latter Latin theology and most clearly the new ecclesiology of Vatican II, this common ground is totally eroded. They've, 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 they've fulfilled what St. Cyprian said they would do, which was grant the Holy Spirit to the various heterodox. And he says it here as well. Let's hear what St. Cyprian says. He anticipates the future path to be taken by Latin ecclesiology. Those who supported accepting heretical baptism claimed that the one outside the church could obtain the grace of baptism by his disposition in faith. St. Familian rejects this idea, stating that those in schism or heresy possess a corrupt disposition and a false faith. St. Augustine will later concede, unfortunately, to heretics an empty baptism. Not unlike the, the unbaptism uh, version, the, the anonymous writer, in which grace is given but inoperative. That's how he says it. You go in and immediately you lose it, according to St. Augustine. This is peculiar to his thinking. At Vatican II, notwithstanding Augustine's theology, because they went even further, much will be made of this point such that the bulk of the new ecclesiological views will claim the good disposition and faith of the dissidents, of the heterodox, as justification for accepting efficacy or fruitfulness among them. So in Vatican II, they, 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 they impart and they accept that all the heterodox, all those who are outside the church, schismatics, heretics, whatever they consider, they all have it because we just give them the good disposition. We give them the, the, uh, the, uh, the faith on a personal level. And so therefore the grace of God is active. And that's what the saints would not give and would not recognize. And it was a consensus of the day. Now, St. Dionysius, and this is the last uh, we have, St. Dionysius of Alexandria, very important figure. Uh, if you remember from some of the podcasts I did, we commemorated him in his writings about the, the actions of those courageous and saintly and uh, martyred Christians during the plague in Alexandria, 
about the time of Pasca, and I think it was like 250. Um, and that was him writing, talking about their, their love and, and giving their lives uh, in the midst of that plague, which are examples for all of us today. This is the same, same, same saint, and he's talking now, responding to the successor to Pope Stephen, Sixtus II, and he inform, uh, Dionysius informs us of the wide agreement in the East on the question of heretical baptism. So we have another witness here that there was a consensus in all of Asia Minor and in the East that they do not accept the legitimacy uh, of heretical baptism. It, quote, it is a fact that resolutions about this question have been passed in the largest synods of bishops. The fact that those who come over from the heresies are first instructed, then washed and cleansed afresh from the filth of the old unclean le leaven. And then another letter he sends to a presbyter in Rome, he says, the practicing of baptizing heretics is not of recent origin in Africa. A long while back, in the time of my Episcopal predecessors, it was adopted in the most populous diocese and in church synods at Iconium, Synod, and many other places. I would not think of upsetting their arrangements and involving them in strife and contention. So he's saying, I'm not going to do what the church in Rome does. I'm not going to... This is not necessary. You're trying to bully everybody and make them do whatever you do. Already we have this unfortunate stance in Rome. This is not going to happen. I'm not, he says, you shall not move your neighbor's boundaries, which were fixed by your ancestors. He's quoting Deuteronomy. So that is a witness from St. Dionysius. We could go on. St. Dionysius has other things, but we don't have time. In baptism, the one, the whole Christ is put on. It's very important. St. Familiar in following the Holy Fathers before him sees baptism not only as the beginning or the first step in the process of salvation. So this is coming to correct this idea that there's a partial communion, there's a beginning of life in Christ just with water baptism. Look, it's the consummation, he says. It's the completion of grace. This is the Orthodox teaching. This might seem a little bit hard to, to get it, you know, to process for our rational minds, but when you're baptized, all of Christ is, is put on. You lack nothing. Right, and, and and it's not there's nothing lacking in, in, in that's a partial it's a partial I I initiation, in the sense of a partial Christ is given in baptism. Now these mysteries should not be seen as separate, like chrismation and communion. They all go together and they all play play a part in the uh, the the initiation process. But but Christ is totally given in, in every mystery. He gives and is given. All of him. There's no division in Christ. When you commune, you commune, commune of the whole Christ, not a part. The whole Christ you commune. There is no division. Having put on Christ, been born from above, and received the seal of the Lord, the newly illumined lacks nothing, could not lack anything. And Clement of Alexandria says exactly the same thing. The whole Christ is imparted, and the whole man is regenerated. This vision of baptism is the same vision expressed in the patristic text as early as the shepherd of Hermes and Clement of Alexandria, as I said, St. Nicholas Cavasilos and St. Seraphim of Seraph and many others. In post schism West, we have incomplete communions we talked about. Listen to this now. Eve Congar, in 1939, he writes, the church includes members who appear to be outside her. They belong to the church insofar as they belong to Christ. It's clear. Clearly, he lays down what will be accepted in Vatican II, that there's a partial, incomplete uh, involvement, participation in Christ. He says, because what unites them to Christ is a fiber of his mystical body, a constituent element of his church. So this is not the patristic teaching. This is totally inconsistent with what we've been talking about. This is The, the vision is holistic. It's all or nothing. And this is partial. It's impossible. You're not a little bit pregnant. There's no a little bit pregnant in the Orthodox Church. You're all or nothing. You all, you have Christ, you're in Christ, or you've fallen away from Christ. Now, we can talk about the spiritual life and the dynamic, but we're talking about the mysteries now. We're talking about what Christ gives, all right? The idea of partial communion with Christ, although baptized into Christ, fundamentally sets this ecclesiology at odds with the patristic vision in which baptism immediately gives man complete union and perfection in Christ and the Church. So we have the underpinnings here of the great theological divide that will develop over time. In the approaches of all three of our Holy Fathers, St. Cyprian, St. Dionysius, and St. Familian, we can already see outlined these important distinguishing marks of the two that I'll, I'll, I'll mention two right here. The distinction between a Caribbean economia, exactitude and economy, which will be filled in by St. Basil the Great, 
He'll give a more of a developed look at that of baptism being simultaneously a new birth and perfection. We see that in all three of our fathers. In these and other aspects, one can already sense stirring underground along this fault line of the baptism of heretics, the great ecclesiological fracture of East and West, the first theological steps away from the consensus patrum in the West with regard to the unity of the church and the mystery of baptism will come with St. Augustine's unique and innovative response to the Donatists. And we'll look at that probably the second session uh, next time. So that is the presentation for today. I try to get it all out there as much as I can. It's a lot more we could talk about. You could go on for hours and hours. Uh, let's see what kind of questions we have from our uh, brothers and sisters. Uh, a lot of questions. And we'll try to answer a few. Probably won't be able to get to uh, all of them. We're already at, uh, let's see, uh, one hour and 40, 47 minutes. So we'll, be, we'll get to a few, but not many. And we'll continue on Thursday. How do we get from the church as the body of Christ? This is Dragos asking. Uh, and is Immaculate Bride considering it an organization that can accommodate heretics that cannot be anathematized for fear of shattering the integrity of the organization? And Pano says nominalism, lack of essence, energy distinction, etc. Uh, so, I mean, in a word, Dragos, in a word, we have secularization. We have secularization. And so uh, this is this is the spirit of Antichrist. This is uh, this is totally destructive of uh, the mind of the church and the narrow path. Uh, and so when we're approaching these patristic texts, we have an agenda. Uh, we have uh, uh, creative, uh, arrogant, uh, academic, usually uh, theological stance where we say, well, what can we take from this or how can we rationalize this or how can this fit into what we need for our particular age? Uh, sometimes it's, it's, it's stated, sometimes it's unstated. Uh, but I think ultimately that's where it goes uh, spiritually. We have uh, falling away. Uh, good night, Christine. God bless you. Uh, and um, <clears throat> and I don't I don't know what else to tell you. I mean, I, intellectually, I'm sure there's there's things that can be pieced pieced together in the West. How we reach there? Uh, I think the 20th century. Uh, with the Orthodox entering into the ecumenical movement uh, is uh, highly influenced by the givens in the Protestant world. So in the 1920s, when they entered into the World Council of Churches, or rather the uh, uh, before the World Council of Churches, they entered into the uh, Faith and Order uh, Commission and all the rest, uh, there was no reworking of the, the parameters. And uh, we accepted that we would work within the parameters of the Protestants. And I, obviously that did not bode well. And over time, there was no change in that. Florovsky tried to change the things. And so we've been working for a hundred years within this foreign uh, ecclesiological uh, climate. And it's, I think, I think it's obviously affected us, those, those Orthodox who are, who are dealing with it. Tatiana, before you go, uh, let me ask you, let me try to answer your question. I met our Archbishop of the Midwest Diocese last week. Forgive me, and I know I probably shouldn't be so critical. <laughs> no, you shouldn't. But I found, uh, yeah, okay. He's obviously fearful of the virus. He's all about mass. He's instrumental in suspending the priests. Uh, he gives me uh, some weird vibes. What do I do with these feelings? My instincts rather steer me wrong. I think he cares more than, okay. So you have all these impressions, right? And this is what, what, and so you have to, uh, you don't turn off your head. You don't turn off your mind. Don't, you don't become mindless. You don't say you don't see things. But in a way, the saints see and they don't see. Uh, insofar as it's pertaining to salvation, protection from delusion, obviously we're going to be very mindful and watchful. Insofar as it's pertaining to their spiritual state, their inner life, uh, what we think they're thinking, all that we need to put aside. That's none of our, not, not our place. We'll never figure it out. Uh, it's very common uh, for people to 
sit and think, well, I th this probably is what they thought, or this probably is what they did, or I bet they're talking to so-and-so and all the rest. So behind, you know, the, the veil of the other person, we can never go. So we need to just, just stop there. Don't go there. Whatever we think, we're un it was unimpressive or impressive or whatever it is, it doesn't matter. It's not our business. We're not judging them. We're not, it's not, God's not asking us to judge them. But when they have positions, theological, spiritual positions, and they, they're, they're teaching that, that's absolutely going to be a time when we're going to be very mindful and we're going to be a, a part of the body and we're going to be a bearing one another's burden. So when we see a priest or a bishop who's, who's not rightly dividing the word of truth, we need to pray for them fervently. Secondly, we need to make sure that we do not come under the delusions. So we need to learn the faith, understand the faith. Uh, we don't have to become academic theologians. We understand the basics. We understand what we confess in the creed and all the rest. And then insofar as we can assist in any way to both help the person not go further into delusion, if that's in our power, and also help other people not to follow the delusion. So if they're actually teaching delusional, heretical things, then we have a responsibility. It's like a sickness. It's like a, a disease. And obviously, we don't want other people to get sick, and we don't want to become sick ourselves. And we don't want the person to die from that sickness. And that's how you stand to, uh, to out of love for the person himself, the bishop or priest or whoever it might be, the theologian who's teaching erroneous things. But that presupposes you know the faith. And so you have a lot of work to do to understand the faith. And I don't mean intellectually, rationally to learn it. I mean to live it and to experience it and to come under to be humble and come under the teachings of the Holy Fathers and to follow the Holy Fathers. So all of that is built up. So if you if remember this, when you stand in judgment of anyone, especially a priest and a bishop, you lose. I mean judgment of the person, not the teaching. No, we don't judge the people. We don't judge the person. We don't say this person's lost, this person's this, that, and the other thing. But the teaching, we absolutely are called to have right and just judgment about what is taught but not to transfer that to the person and then uh, uh, end up sinning. And when we judge a priest, uh, there's a, a very good saying from uh, Elder Ephraim. I think it was Elder, uh, it was Elder Ephraim, but I'm not sure if I'm going to get this right. Um, if, uh, if we are wrong about our judgment about a priest, we have a burning coal in our mouth. And if we're right about our judgment, we have a... Uh, a, a black coal in our mouth. So in other, in in either way, we're not going to come out um, better off for that stance. So let's learn how to discern what what we're going to judge. We're not judging people. We're not judging bishops or priests. God forbid. We're judging teachings, and we're avoiding bad teachings, and we're teaching and following the orthodox teaching. Of course, Tatiana, we all fail and we get up again, and we struggle. And we call upon God night and day. That's the key. None of us can do it uh, without God. Uh, Arturo, our Roman Catholic Church's synagogues of Satan then was my Roman baptism, not a baptism. Okay, so synagogues of Satan is from the um, book of Revelation, and it's referring in particular to uh, those heretical groups that were in that particular city in uh, Asia Minor, and I think it was in particular referring to synagogues uh, of the Jews. And, of course, they were not following Christ. They had, they, had, they had rejected the Messiah. And so that's why the term in the book of Revelation is referred to that. So I don't think, um, you know, historically, particularly the book of Revelation is talking about um, heterodox groups or certainly not about the papal Protestant uh, confession. Uh, so, um, so that... That phrase is probably not applicable, although gatherings of heretical groups have always been considered uh, not places of the spirit of God, but the spirit of the passions, and the spirit of the of the enemy. So generally speaking, heretical, heterodox uh, uh, gatherings, synaxes are not, we do not, as we just heard from all of Holy Fathers, do not consider them to be uh, places where the spirit of God dwells. Uh, then, as far as the baptism is concerned, we just got done presenting that there's only one baptism. It's the it, it has presuppositions, and that is that the Orthodox faith is taught, and it's in the actual continuation of the incarnation, which is the Church in historical time and place, and that's where the mystery happens. Uh, what what 
actually happen 90% of the time, and I think probably my guess is in your case, but maybe you're an exception, that you were not even baptized. In other words, you were not immersed because that's what baptism means. And we need to really stick to that. People say, well, it doesn't matter. You can be poured, you can be poured, you can be immersed or not. It doesn't matter. Yes, it does. It's, it does. It's, a, it's absolutely essential that we not lose that because it's a part of the mystery and it's the symbolism, but also the reality go together. And that is essential. And the saints say that. That's what the saints teach. I'm not telling you what I think. I'm telling you what the saints teach. Uh, Saint uh, Cosmas of Atelos, for instance, is very strict on this, extremely strict. Uh, and so, um, so first of all, first of all, unfortunately, in Catholicism today, they've lost even the form, and vast majority of time, they just pour a little water over the head. So it's a bit of a mockery in terms of the form of what a what a mystery is, and we we don't accept what Aquinas taught that it doesn't matter if you use pouring or sprinkling or immersing. We don't believe that. The word does not mean just washing, as he as he took it. He said that, that baptism means washing. It doesn't mean washing. It means immersing into the water because it, it is a death. <clears throat> you go into the tomb and you rise out of that. And it's very important uh, that we are obedient to the Lord and obedient to the holy tradition. And if there's no reason, and there's really almost never a reason today, we have all the means that are at our disposal, there's no reason not to do the mystery appropriately as God taught as the as as the Holy Fathers passed on there are very few extenuating circumstances people have rivers near them they have they can fill up a, a, a very large uh, horse trough whatever it is and mystery can happen as God intends and, and that that humility that obedience is going to bring great fruit for the person who's doing the mystery and for the person who's actually participating in the mystery so uh, just to, just to get that off as far as you know, what uh, whatever God is doing in your life as a heterodox on the way to orthodoxy, there are many things that he's doing. The providence of God is taking care of you and is, is, is providing for you. Uh, and the, the spirit of God is guiding you and teaching you and revealing uh, the truth to you in many ways before you are actually immersed in the, in the font. Uh, but the life of purification, illumination, and deification does not begin until we enter the church, and we enter the church uh, through baptism, uh, chrismation, and communion. That's the norm. That's what God, that the Lord the Lord has taught, and what the Holy Fathers have passed on to us. Pano asks, Father, do you feel the return uh, that there will be a, a the events surrounding the the uh, Saint John Vatatsi's uh, I definitely see World War III on the horizon and marking the end of Western civilization itself, the final chapter of Father's Air from Surah, of course, if you, if you will, I'm fearful yet hopeful. No one knows the times. No one knows the dates. And anyone who says it's going to happen in six months or a year, it's a projection. It may or may not happen. And it's, uh, it's better not to project. Now, there's all kinds of things that one can see and one can uh, venture an uh, estimation. Uh, and and I think there's legitimacy to that, but I think it's better not to predict and not to say in six months or three months or a year this that and the other thing is going to happen. It's not the way that the, the, and the and the saints don't do that. The the prophecies don't do that. The pro, the prophets themselves don't do that. Uh, they don't speak in particular. They say because ultimately it's a mystery because it, it's it has to do with the freedom of men. Whether, whether they repent or not. If men, mankind repents, all these events are pushed back. The, the, the trials and tribulations and the wars are pushed back. So uh, I, don't, I don't think it's good to try to project. I think what we need to do is realize that everything is in God's hands. Everything is, is, is his uh, providence caring for us. And even all this trial that we're going through is actually, if we have a good disposition and we love Christ, it will work for good. You're far from the mysteries for months. You don't can't get into a church because there's uh, all these obstacles. Um, turn it around and say, since God has allowed it, it's for my salvation. I'm going to go and pray more in my room. And I'm, I'm going to read the services more. It's an opportunity for me to read the service instead of just stand in church and listen. It's not, turn it around. Do whatever you have to do. Stay within the principles, but also do what you have to do to not allow these opportunities to go because that's that's 
not if you have not a it's not a caused by your sin and your uh, mindlessness, you know, our mindlessness. Uh, but if God has allowed it, His providence has allowed it, then we should accept it peacefully and say this is what God has allowed, and not be distraught. So I don't think we should be distraught about any of it. Not even in the end times, we should be never be distraught. There's no justification for being anxious for any of that because God is in control of it all. Um, <clears throat> So Sean asked the following question. How schismatic does an individual need to be before we can confidently say with St. Ignatius that they will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do we say that no one in schism will inherit the kingdom of God? How do we communicate this teaching to those in other Christian traditions outside the Orthodox Church? And then you go on and you ask, is it proper to say that the Holy Spirit is working outside the church to bring people into the church? Absolutely. Absolutely. Who else? If it's not the Holy Spirit, who's bringing him? Uh, we believe that God is working night and day to bring people in. And many times we're the obstacle for them to come because we're not living according to his commandments. We're not, they can't see in us the, the image of, and likeness of God. Uh, but there's no doubt that the Holy Spirit is working throughout all of creation to bring people to salvation. If so, are there other ways in which we can confidently say the Holy Spirit is working outside the church? Uh, Providentially, uh, all of providence, uh, he sustains uh, all of creation. Uh, he enlightens every man that comes into the world. That's a, that, that kind of enlightenment is not the enlightenment we talk about from the divine energies of purification and illumination, deification, but it's an enlightenment to come to know the truth about who is Christ, what is the church. That enlightenment comes from the Holy Spirit. Uh, that's still at the door so to speak, of real experience in spiritual life um, in terms of purification, illumination in the church, you can know a lot about Christ. You could be an Orthodox Christian for years and have learned everything about the Tipicon and about the scriptures and still not have a, a, a deep or even a, a, a elemental spiritual life because that's that, that knowledge about is not uh, the epignosis, the experiential knowledge that comes uh, when we carry out the commandments and when we pray and when we fast and when we when we are humbled and all the rest, that is a part of the spiritual struggle. So two, two different things, but that's the Holy Spirit that's bringing about those, even that knowledge. So um, that that is not yet a Christian, however, that's put on Christ. Can you see the distinction? So I think we can talk, and now to answer your question, how do we talk to other people who are not Orthodox about the Orthodox Church, about teaching of the Orthodox Church. Well, um, the church preaches Christ. And so that's that's what we need to bring to the world and to everyone uh, who is interested. And so everything that is Christ, that's what we need to preach and teach and share with people. And first of all, by our experience and by our example, and then, and then uh, the actual teachings of the saints. So where's Christ? Christ is in the church. Christ is in the Eucharist. Christ is in the saints. Uh, Christ is shown forth uh, in the history of the church, the truth of the church, the truth of the gospel, the dogmas. These are all the things that we're going to share with people and communicate. Um, as far as communicating the teaching of about that we did tonight about the saints, I don't think that's. I don't think Saint Ignatius was going around when when he would have an opportunity to talk to some pagan. Or Saint Cyprian, they wouldn't start talking about the inner life of the church. They wouldn't start talking about you know the teachings of the Holy Fathers to people who are not initiated. Now we're doing this over internet. Anybody can watch this. That's just the nature of things today. Unfortunately, we're all in, in the same uh, setup. I mean, it's good and bad. It's got ups and downs, right? But normally, this would not be something you would you would talk about with. You know anybody and everybody. You would this is this is not the discussion you have with a non-orthodox. You talk about the life of the church the, and the and the glory of of our Lord, and that's that's what people need to, to hear, and that's what we need to talk about. So, um, as far as how schismatic as an individual will need to be, I mean, again, it's not about degrees of schism. Once you are outside the church and and you're not living the life of the church, you're not being purified, you're not being uh, illumined in the through the grace of the mysteries and through the prayer of the church, it doesn't matter if you're five feet out or 500 feet out as far as the 
existential reality is you're not participating in the church's life, right? Now, it does matter if you, in the sense of how hard it will be to come back. So if somebody's just barely gone out in terms of intellectually, you know, rejected the teachings of the church, but not severely, or rejected some person in the church, and now they're outside of communion, that could be a relatively small, short distance in terms of return. It all depends on the person and their pride. There could be somebody else who has all kinds of crazy teachings, and they're much further away. They have a lot to relearn or learn. But on the other hand, that kind of distance really to God is immaterial, right? It's not God can take somebody from 500 feet away and bring them in, in more quickly than the person five feet away. So I think that whole distance question intellectually, spiritually, is to a certain degree relative with their repentance and with God's grace that would come to the repentant. So it doesn't, it doesn't always work that way. You know, if you're really a moral person, you're really a good person, you may never become a spiritual person. Whereas somebody else who's very sinful and is not moral, they might have a, grave rep a great repentance and become a part of the church uh, like St. Saint, Saint Mary of Egypt did or something, right? <clears throat> so it's, uh, it's not about degrees of schism. I mean, the minute you go, the minute you, now, we should say this, that those who've never been in the church, they might hold heresy, but they're not heretics in the sense that they, or schismatics in the sense that they, they were in the church and they left. And I think that's an important distinction. Now, suddenly Father Sierra from Rose mentions uh, that we shouldn't go around calling people heretics. Obviously, this is a long, uh, you know, a schism and a, a heresy that was preached long ago. For most people, they've been out and never even known the church. So obviously, we're not going to, that's not going to be a part of our preaching, right? It's not going to be our teaching. We're talking about this for the sake of the faithful. We're talking about this to people who are Orthodox. We're talking about how we need to understand the boundaries of the church and the truth of the church uh, so that we not, we don't lose uh, our, our way and we remain in the church and we remain, go deeper. Uh, but if we have somebody who's never, never, Experience the church, doesn't know anything about the church. We're not going to talk about them as schismatics or heretics, obviously. right? There needs to be discernment uh, about how we share these things. Uh, so, Tem Dayub, if I got that right. I don't know if I got that right. He's got a question. I heard a priest saying that in order to condemn someone by a council, he has to be able to defend himself, hence... Why Origins condemnation the Fifth Ecumenical Council was pro wasn't proper, and this by reference to the Roman Canon Law that the Church refers to in its councils. I was puzzled by the statement since we know that Ecumenical Councils don't err. Your thoughts, Father? Yeah, I would I would uh, say that that's a very kind of nice legalistic uh, way to approach that, but I think that uh, there's a there's a lot more to it, and I think that the the, the problem with that stance is that uh, on some legal basis or something, we're going to doubt the, the, the wisdom and the decision, not of one council, but of several, because it was repeated, uh, the condemnation. And now, obviously, the, only God can determine the state of anyone. So this is not necessarily after they've departed this life. I mean, there's in this life, the church has the power. God gave the power to the apostles to separate people from communion for their salvation's sake, right? The, re the the fact that we would end up having to do that with someone means that there's no repentance. And so, in the case in the in the case of Origin, um, the teachings were condemned. The person was condemned as well. What that means eternally, only God knows. Uh, it's hard to say, um, but. I would trust the church. I, I, I have no reason to doubt the church. I think it's very dangerous when you start doubting the church. Um, and um, and there's a very good reason why the church does what it does. It's pedagogical. It's salvific. Uh, so I think the stance is problematic. Um, to, to stand here in the 21st century and look back at ecumenical councils 1,500 years ago, 1,400 years ago, and to say, well, you know, they didn't get it right. I think that's that's problematic. I, I wouldn't want to do that because I think that's going to be the beginning of other falls or other delusions uh, because we undermine we undermine uh, our uh, our trust in the church. Anastasia, God bless you. Thank you. Uh, 
let's see who we got other questions here uh your blessing father peter this is vasily and anna the thief was saved by christ after his confession he was not baptized but he didn't have a chance to be, so Christ does what he has to do in order to save souls. Isn't it also true to say that the Christ saved the thief without ba holy baptism because he hadn't established the sacrament of holy baptism until later? So it is obvious the thief was saved without baptism. Well, he hadn't established it. Well, I mean, the the, the apostles were baptized, and I know that it was, it was pre-Pentecost, and so, yeah. But I think that it doesn't. It doesn't matter the practical. If he if he had if he had been down off the cross. I mean, he was on the cross, obviously. Right. So so whether whether there was access or not is there was no baptism, and there was salvation. And I think the point here is that God can do that, and He can do that not just for the thief on the cross in the particular circumstances of the thief on the cross, but He can do that if necessary. Uh, He's not the important thing here is he's not bound by his own commandments. He's not we don't have God and then above him is his commandments. It doesn't make him a liar if he diverts from it because he sees and understands things that we could never see and understand and he fulfills the essence of it. And I think that's the key with economy. If we're going to actually be working with God synergy right with god in the salvation of people's souls we have to really actually be in a state and in a place of, as a bishop or a priest especially where we have the discernment and the wisdom to determine that this is actually an economy which is salvific or it's and it's not a departure from the economy of salvation which many times people uh, the impression one has is that we have departures in the name of economy from the economy of salvation. And it's, of course, very uh, frightful and fearful for a priest and a bishop to um, to wield that and to put that into effect. Uh, I think there's a very good case to be made, and I spent years researching and reading about this to the point where I can feel comfortable to say it. There's a very good case to be made that there is no basis for economy today. In other words, the, the, the great need that we saw with the thief on the cross or in any of the church's, you know, uh, actions of economy throughout church history, whether it be particular people or, 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 or large groups of people, you know, there has to be an urgent and a, and a, and a real need and a, and a reason. And it has to be temporary and it has to be uh, not something that becomes the norm. And we really have made it the norm in many places, in many dioceses, in many local churches, the We've made it the norm to say you will be received by economy. Why? When the person especially wants to be baptized, why? That's not the that's not the the teaching of the fathers. That's not the example of the fathers. Um, Saint Basil in his forty seven canon or in his first canon gives us the sense of things. And, you know, he says, yeah, they might do it for economy. We don't have any reason to do it. We baptize, and he insists on it, even though they they baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And he insists that they be baptized with the baptism of the church. So the church is free. You know, we have this idea, well, oh, we have to do this. Because they were baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and there was water used, we have to chrismate. There's none of that in the church fathers. St. Basil's clear. I don't, I don't care what they're doing in Rome. We're not doing that. We will baptize. If, the, if this was an idea that you cannot because they, the heterodox do X, Y, Z, or the heretics do X, Y, Z, that's exactly what's what they were objecting to about Pope Stephen. Look, he was saying, well, they don't baptize, so we're not going to baptize either. That, that is irrelevant. We don't follow the practices of those outside the church and mimic them. It's irrelevant what the Roman Catholics or the or the, or the Protestants or the or the or the non-Chalcedonian are doing today. We have our own criteria, we have our own life, and we have the acrivia, which is baptism, and chrismation, and communion. We depart from that with fear and trembling for a particular reason for a time. That's when we're going to be in the spirit of the patristic teaching on a uh, on economy and Nicodemia. Uh, Hope I answered your question. I don't know, Basili. Um, but you made a good point. I mean, there's, there's historically, but I, I think that beyond that, there's the, the point about economy and the need stands, whatever the case with 
thief on the cross. Uh, let's see. Uh, Greg has a question. What should inquirers and catechumens pray in the meantime before they are actually receiving at the church? Is it appropriate for them to get a prayer book like the Jordanville one and do morning evening prayers? Absolutely, Greg. That It goes without saying that the catechumens are going to be initiated into the life of the church and they're going to be praying. You can do everything except commune. You can do everything the church is doing. You're going to start doing the prayer rule. You're going to start saying the prayers. You're going to go to the services. I mean, I think if I was your priest, if you came to my parish, uh, or my chapel, whatever, I would say you need to leave during the catechumenate. When they say catechumens depart, you need to depart. That's good for you. And every catechumen, it's wonderful. It's not bad. You're gonna, it's 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 gonna be so much better when you when you arrive at the day of your baptism. If you've done that, um, you're gonna feel like this is the first time you've stayed in the divine liturgy, you've participated, and now you're going to commune. And, until the, and you're going to go out, and you're going to feel the need. It's just, a, it's just a, pedagogically, it's the best thing. And I wish more priests would do it. I encourage all the priests to do it because this is where we're at. We're no longer in the, in the old country. We're in a missionary setting all over the world, and we need to get back to the principles and, and put those into practice. Read the, the, uh, the uh, Catechesis of St. Cyril of Jerusalem. Read that, and it's one of the most important ancient uh, catechisms. Uh, but yeah, you should be praying. And, and in fact, the the, the catechumenate, uh, Greg, is for purification. Catechumenate is is not for learning about Christ. It's for entering into the life of Christ as much as possible before baptism. For preparing for baptism is for being purified of the old ways, the old habits, uh, the passions, the 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 the, the uh, narcissism of our age, the nihilism of our age, all these sicknesses that are that are out there. Uh, this th th it begins now as a catechumen. You, that's why they spend three years. It doesn't gonna happen in six months. They spend a long time in the Asian Church. Why? Because it takes time to get all those old habits out, be established, be well established in the new way of life. So when you are when you approach baptism, you're going to really experience baptism. You're going to have a big knowledge by experience of the Holy Spirit. That's the goal. Not just to have the event, and because of course God gives His Spirit, nobody doubts that. But do we receive it? Do we experience it? That's up to us. That's our our uh, part of the synergy. That's our half of the of the bargain, so to speak. Right? We've got to do that. And so that's the process of the catechumen. And, and you prepare yourself through ascetic life. You begin now, praying, fasting, <clears throat> reading. And participating in the services, start to learn the services, start to read the services, read the paraclesis, the supplication service, read the prayers before, uh, start to familiarize yourself with the prayers before communion. It's not a bad idea. When you go to first commune, you, you're already familiar with them. Um, the exorcism prayers could be read not just once or twice, but many times uh, during the process, especially the last 40 days uh, during Lent, if you're going to be baptized on Pascha. You, should, you could read them many times. There's nothing that says that, that you only read them once. Um, so anyway, I think I answered your question. Let's, let's, let's hear from somebody else. All right. Let's see Gregory. Gregory's got a tough one for me. Let's see. As we know, God respects. Let's see what time we got. All right. So this is the last question. We're at 2.20. Um, people on the west East Coast, it's going almost midnight, right? Uh, as on the East Coast. As we know, God respects our freedom, and if we persist in sins without repenting, we may withdraw his protecting grace, which leaves us open for all types of evil to afflict us. Over the past year, we have heard juris justifications of the various renovationist measures in the temple based upon the reality of people getting sick or even dying, supposedly from sicknesses caught in the temple. This is what they claim. Is it possible that such people get sick, got sick and even died simply because they accepted the blasphemous measures? Is it possible that these measures, this placing of trust in science instead of God, caused God to withdraw his protecting grace, and therefore sickness and death came to some? In short, could it be that the very measures aimed at preventing sickness and death are actually causing sickness and death? Well, I think that last sentence you made is actually very interesting because I think that there's a case to be made, at least there's a suspicion on a lot of people's parts, that the measures and the methodology that, that have been employed, whether out of ignorance or whether out of cunning, it's unknown, 
uh, are not leading to health. I mean, I've seen that in Greece in any case. I can't speak for America, but in Greece, we see it with good friends of ours, other people who've suffered, and a few that have died, um, that the, the so-called uh, therapy for this sickness or whatever it is um, was was a disaster, and they're not even and and so there's we can see practically speaking that in fact the things that are, we've been told at times were not that way on the on the physical level. Now on the spiritual level, um, what do we know about sickness? Sickness comes, uh, we believe, uh, it's not just a bodily. I mean, generally, illness of the human person doesn't just come only physically, only on the physical level, on the body level, but it comes also because of the soul. The soul come, becomes sick, and the soul affects the body. So it's very well known that, that um, and more and more people are talking about it, even in, in medical profession, that anxiety causes sickness. Anxiety might even cause cancer. You know, there might be things about these psychosomatic state of a human being which was will provoke sickness so can we say that departure from i mean adam and eve departed from the communion with god and they got really sick didn't they and they died uh so what does that tell us well communion with god is life communion with god is health so if we depart from that and when we close churches and when we don't commune because whatever, there's spoons, multiple spoons, and people are scandalized, and whatever else that we've been, that's been causing our disruption of communion with God, or we've been scandalized and we're not even attending services anymore because we can't stand uh, being in the temple with, with all these measures, and there's plenty of people who feel this way, and their conscience is bothering them, and they don't want to stand there and be a part of it. I mean, all of that is not producing anxiety, is not producing sickness, uh, we have to, even those who are struggling to be conscientious and struggling to be mindful and really uh, don't feel comfortable with all the innovations, it's really important that that doesn't become a state of anxiety, a state of sickness of the soul, because that's not certainly beneficial. That's sick. That's going to be terrible spiritually. We have to abandon ourselves to God's providence. Abandon ourselves to God's providence and his love in everything we do. This should be one of the lessons we're learning through this whole crisis, to trust him more, not less. And I think there's been a lot of people who've woken up through this crisis. They said, you know what? I lost the church. I really want the church. I didn't realize how I was taking it for granted. Those people are making a new beginning, and they're, they're, they're becoming uh, healed. Uh, so to answer your question, do well. Let's, let me answer it more generally. Blasphemy does blasphemy bring sickness? Absolutely. Does impiety bring sickness? Absolutely. Does pride and arrogance bring sickness? Absolutely. All these things are six sickness of the soul. They're not going to bring sickness to the body. How does the body die? Because the soul is sick and is separated from life, which is Christ. So I don't think I don't think it's. Uh, all that a revolutionary thought. Uh, it's hard to say, you know, piece by piece, every aspect of the what's creating the anxiety and what what is legitimately creating anxiety. That would be a longer discussion. Hopefully, I answered your question. I don't know. It was a long question. Um, Father bless. Catherine has a question. Why is St. Augustine considered a saint in our Orthodox Church? Well, he was uh, a church father in North Africa. He was never condemned for anything. His teachings were received in, the, in uh, his part of the world, and he was revered for his life. Um, obviously, over time, when the rest of the church got to learn about some of his teachings, and they became widely disseminated in the second millennium, because I think in the first millennium it was much more limited, although they didn't read him. Uh, some of his teachings were more problematic, but really a lot of it is that they, the way that it was approached and the way he was, he was used in the West as much as uh, just his teaching per se. But, but so there are teachings which do seem to be and are problematic and consistent with our dogmatic consciousness. Uh, I've discovered them in my research 
in terms of baptism and chrismation and reception and ecclesiology, that there are things that are very peculiar to St. Augustine. Um, but the church accepts those saints that are recognized in local churches. So if, if today in Russia, the Holy Synod and the people embraced a saint and said, this is a saint of God, and they produced a life and a service and everything, they're, in Greece, they're not going to do investigations into that. They're not. They're going to accept the, that the Russian Church has the um, ability and the the responsibility to declare this person as a God pleaser and in heaven, and the and the veneration will be just just taken by the rest of the Church. And that's what happened in the West. The West decided North Africa, uh, probably first and foremost, they 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 considered him a saint locally, and. The East had no reason and no ability and no there would be no reason for it to, to object because the writings weren't really well known at all at the time. So he became accepted. Uh, you know, Saint uh, Photius the Great says, uh, I think it's Saint Photius the Great says basically that when we have a case where there's errors by a church father, we 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 are silent about those. In other words, we put them aside. We don't reject the person. We reject the teachings. And it's possible for a saint to have a, a, make errors, especially when they're theor they're more speculative thinkers, right? It's very possible. And and so Saint Augustine wrote a, a lot, and he was more speculative and philosophical in his approach. And so, not surprising that he has uh, a few more errors than uh, than others. Unfortunately, those errors have uh, have been have been magnified because of his popularity in the West. And they've not been corrected uh, by the larger church until until recently. There's an attempt. Anyway, let's close it there. We've got uh, just a few more questions. One, two, three, three questions, four questions. But we're going to leave them for Thursday. We'll see you on Thursday. God bless you. Thank you uh, for being here. And uh, uh, we'll see you uh, Thursday at 9 p.m. God bless you. And all, you, all of you who come and just visited and stayed with us, thank you. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for listening. And uh, hope you'll join us on Patreon, or we'll see you next Tuesday. We'll say the prayer. We'll chant the, the prayer into the Holy Cross. Mm -hmm. So, son, kiri, eton, laon, su, kev, logi, son, ting, lero, no, mi, an, su, ni, kans, tis, van, si, la, si, Catavar var on dorum enos, Ketun som filanton, Vian tu stabrusu politerman. To the praise of the Holy Father Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy on us and save us. Amen. God bless you all.